OK, so how do populations change? Because they don't stay the same forever, right? We're all just getting older. There are a handful of ways that we measure the changes in the composition of a population. Now we're going to do some formulas. I'm going to warn you in advance. I'd like you to know these formulas. I don't need you ever to operationalize them. I will not ask you to bring your calculators to, to the midterm or anything. I just need you to understand the ways that we measure populations, OK? I'm not a very mathematical guy, so if I can handle this, I'm sure you can. We talk about a few different qualities, fertility, fecundity, and mortality. This is important, especially for those of you that have maybe studied biology, um, stats, demographics, those sorts of things. These definitions are really frustrating, OK? So in this course, fertility, because they're reversed in, in ecology versus in, let's say, uh, biostatistics, math, demographics. So don't be stressed by that. But in this course, fertility is actual reproduction, OK? Actual reproduction, reproduction that has happened. How many children have you had? I've had three or whatever there, then your personal fertility rate is, is a total of three lifetime. Good for you. Fecundity, the second one, is the capacity to reproduce. OK? That's different. It sounds quite nuanced, but it's important. We're going to talk about both of those this year. You could imagine how one would change and not the other. A woman who's perfectly fertile but who has a really stressful job might decide, gosh, I don't think I have time for, for children you know, yet. So her fertility may remain zero, even though her fecundity is perfectly high. Right? I don't know how many people in this room have children. I don't. Uh, so in that case, this classroom's fertility rate might be very, very low, even though, let's say, 95% of the females in Toronto are fertile. Or sorry, fecund. <laughs> huh. Do we understand? Actual reproduction is fertility. The capacity, the ability to reproduce is fecundity. The reason that these interest us is because those can change independently of each other. Right? We can imagine environments where certain environmental stresses would reproduce the ability to have children. Right? We could also imagine stresses within an environment that would reproduce the actual having of children, the choice to have children. Does this make sense? Yes. OK. And then lastly, mortality. Does everyone know what that is? <laughs> yes. We're fond of that as a measure. Mortality is, is death. We're fond of that as a measure in this class because it's easy to measure. It's quite definitive. You know, declaring someone dead <laughs> is, is a sure thing. And it happens only once. Fertility can be tricky, right? You have multiple children at different times in your life and so on. Mortality is a super easy measure. And if you stink at math, it's normally the one that you can always get right. right? I learned that lesson the hard way. So, mortality we define as the death of an individual. And we've already defined individual, so we are interested in mortality as the death of an individual. Now, we measure a few different things. First, let's talk about the general fertility rate. This is an indicator that we see all the time. General fertility rate. Here's our formula. Is defined as 1,000 times the number of births over the number of females aged 15 to 44. Cool. So k just means that we multiply this formula by 1,000, right? So that's how we measure mort uh, fertility. Measure it out of the thousand. All right. So, 1,000 times the number of births in a population, right, in a given year, divided by the number of women, that's females, who are aged 15 to 44. Why? We generally consider 15, uh, sorry, 14 and 45 to be sort of the, the outside of a uh, female's reproductive life as a human. We don't consider that too many people have children above or below that age. Sound good? Right. 
Next, the crude death rate, CDR. Are you guys seeing this okay back there? Is that all right? Yeah. All right. The crude death rate is also measured per thousand. So we have K times deaths per population. Now, this is important. That's population at the midpoint of the year. Why would you do that? It just allows us to standardize the results. Account for seasonal variations and things? Yeah. Yes? Is there a reason why in the beginning of the year we're not chosen as the next day? The midpoint allows you an average. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, uh, I think it's just so that it's standardized. Yeah. So we have deaths per population at midpoint times 1,000. Has everybody got those? Can I take those down? Yes. IMR is the infant mortality rate. This again, per thousand, so that's K times D0 over B. So we've already said births are B, right? And D is deaths. So what is D0? D0 is deaths of children under the age of one. Okay. So infant mortality is only a measure of deaths among children who are aged from 0 to 12 months old. As soon as they're older than that, then for our purposes they fall into that general mortality, the, the CDR population instead. Okay? Interestingly, CDR includes all deaths, so it would also encompass infant mortality. Right? And then lastly, the crude rate of natural increase. You can probably imagine where this is going. Oops. Rate of natural increase is essentially the difference in these figures. So, also 1,000 times births, that's capital B minus all deaths, that's capital D, right? Over population at midpoint in the year. So, there are a few reasons why we're interested in all these formulas. Demographers want to know them, you know, right down to the decimal place so that they can plan state structures and so on. For us, we're interested in them for a variety of reasons. So, for instance, crude death rate. Very useful for comparisons between countries, between regions, between populations. Because crude death rate's reliable, generally, it's easy to measure, it's standardized, right? it gives us a single point of reliable data that's pretty unambiguous to measure. Like we said, people only die once. Okay? And it's not difficult to declare someone dead and then to factor that into the calculation. Whereas it can be more complicated to figure out other statistics. When we talk about the infant mortality rate, the IMR, that's usually interesting to us as a measure of development. Okay? So those of you interested in health studies, political science, uh, international development, you will frequently see infant mortality used as an index of how well a society is able to provide for mothers, young children. It's also a rough index of the health of the healthcare system in a country, the quality of the infrastructure and stuff. So it gives us a nice thumbnail sketch of the overall picture of health and human development in a population. Right? And then lastly, that crude rate of natural increase, this is an interesting one. We're interested in that often when we're thinking about demographic transition, which we'll talk about at more length later. But demographic transition is the model that we use to talk about the process of moving from a society that has very high mortality and very high fertility, right? so large family sizes and lots of death and disease, and then gradually transitioning to a society where you have low mortality low fertility, right? Canada today, not at replacement, right? In terms of its fertility rate, 
That is to say, the Canadians are not having enough children to maintain a stable population. Haven't for years, actually. The only thing that keeps Canada growing is, is immigration anymore. That's important to remember because, as useful and helpful as all of these statistics are, today especially, and historically in some cases, migration is a way more important factor than any of those. Right? So if you, as a Torontonian, decide to have two children instead of one, that's fine, that's your decision, but you're immediately outweighed by the 6,000 people that arrive here tomorrow to make a new life in Canada. Right? That has a, a much larger effect on Canada. Right? Similarly, out-migration. Right? My grandparents came here from Ireland during the potato famine a long time ago when half of the population left the country in the space of a generation. Massive. And now the Irish have you know, a sort of diaspora communities all over the world where they've started new lives, new communities, and so on. So you have huge in and out migration effects that usually end up outweighing some of these factors like fertility, fecundity, mortality, and so on. Okay? Great.